Hello everybody, my name is Michael Dunn. I'm an Associate Professor at the Centre for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. In this third clip, we're going to look at some of the broader implications of moral distress in the round. We're going to review the main causes of moral distress and we're going to think about the short and long-term implications of not mitigating moral distress as experienced by those working in healthcare professional settings. Essentially, we'll take some of our learning from the previous clip around the case we discussed and think about it more generally to a wider range of potential scenarios where moral distress could be experienced. So first, I think it's really important to note that these moral events that Morley and colleagues think are critical to defining moral distress are an endemic and very common feature of healthcare settings. They are everywhere all the time in day-to-day -day clinical and healthcare practice more generally. So, as I mentioned previously, at a conceptual level at least, at the abstract level, moral distress has been defined in terms of multiple moral events. That's the preferred uh, account given by Morley and colleagues. It's the underpinning to this broad account of moral distress that I, I went to uh, at the end of my first clip. So as I said, these kinds of moral events in the round, because they're so multiple in character, are commonplace. Moral dilemmas are a frequent uh, part of day-to-day -day practice. There are many decisions that need to be made where ethical values are in conflict with each other. Most typically, conflicts, for example, between respecting the person's autonomy and doing good for them. Sometimes we can't do those two things together, the two courses of action that those values require. They are mutually exclusive. So we have to make trade-offs and do wrong by not being able to do both good things at once. In practice, policies written down in ethical guidance terms or laws regulating medical practice will only, give us, will only go so far to helping us to resolve those kinds of tensions. We can't always rely on them to settle dilemmas. So we'll constantly have these dilemmas occurring in a very practical way in day-to-day decision-making scenarios. I think it's also reasonable to point out that the institutional constraints on good action or ideal ethical conduct are themselves frequent and difficult to displace. Not least because in a publicly funded healthcare system, at the very least, institutional and funding constraints will be ever-present. There'll only be so much resource to go round. There will be constraints placed on gold standard care practices, on the ways in which uh, resources are allocated between patients. There will be policies that, in the round, don't look particularly ethically robust or defensible if we had unlimited resource or we designed the perfect healthcare system. And finally, institutional cultures are hard to change and tend to build in a certain way over time. They typically take a hierarchical form and built around bureaucratic process and procedure. They're not the kinds of systems that are often best placed to allow uh, moral agency on healthcare professionals' parts to be exercised. They often require very programmatic or proceduralized strategies of care. So that might give rise to difficulties for professionals who want to act in the right way, want to exercise their moral agency, but are bound by policies or bound by hierarchical expectations that simply don't enable them to do so. In a similar way, these institutions can actually start to encode wider social biases or implicit biases in healthcare. Uh, and so they can sort of, sort of reinforce disadvantages in the ways in which they function, partly because those who work in them are themselves social uh, people. They are they, they, they're products of their own social environments in that sense. And they can also develop and propagate those environments in a highly bureaucratic system. But also, quite often, they'll incl be inculcated by certain kinds of patterns of personal moral belief. So that's particularly the case, I think, in an ethically diverse society where you might have a a large minority of a healthcare practitioner group in an institutional setting who has an objection, a conscientious objection to a certain uh, way of practicing medicine, for example. It will be very difficult to accommodate those people in procedures that satisfy their pers personal moral convictions. And so, in that sense, uh, moral events of the kind that give rise to moral distress will be commonly occurring. 
So let's think a bit about the empirical realities of experiences of moral distress. Um, in fact, whilst we can see that these moral events are commonplace, I think, in, in healthcare settings, the actual evidence base for the presence of moral distress is very mixed. And I think partly that's a, a result of poor conceptual analysis. One of the problems in the literature has been that people are developing tools to measure moral distress out of different conceptual accounts of what moral distress is. So the, so the data sets don't speak to each other in any obvious way. And depending on the tool you look at and the reviews you do, you get very different kinds of outcomes about the levels of moral distress and the kinds of moral distress being experienced. It's another reason why uh, precision in conceptual analysis is so important. If we can get behind the same account of moral distress, we can agree the measurement tools that properly ascertain the outcomes on the basis of that account. So generally, this area suffers from low quality data in my view, and, and indeed most of it has predominantly focused on nurses' experiences of moral distress, partly again because the heritage of this concept comes from the nursing ethics literature. So interestingly, we see some systematic reviews of the data suggesting that moral distress is not a major problem uh, amongst nurses, and other reviews that suggest it's much more significant a problem depending on the tools measured and the way in which the review is being conducted. Certain patterns, however, are observable and worth noting, I think, for our purposes. First, there is definite evidence consistently, I think, that moral distress is experienced more commonly and frequently by women than men, and also by people working as professionals in lower and middle income countries than in higher income countries. It's also, I think, consistently the case in the data that there are higher forms of, high, uh, sorry, more frequent manifestations of moral distress and more severe kinds of moral distress in certain specialties than others. And particularly, we see moral distress being more commonly experienced and its effects being more severe in critical care and in psychiatry. At least that's what the data suggests. We also see that over time, moral distress seems to have become a worse problem in healthcare systems across the world and it's been exacerbated particularly during and since the COVID-19 pandemic for obvious reasons I think. Now whilst the data has focused on nurses experience it hasn't been limited to that so we also know that moral distress is experienced at school by nursing students and medical students who are merely observing the craft of practice. It's also experienced by doctors across different specialties, by family caregivers who are caring for their loved ones at home perhaps, and also even amongst those clinical ethics committees members who are brought into play to help solve and address and advise on moral, moral dilemmas quite commonly. So now let's move on to thinking about the outcomes of moral distress. So we, we're getting a sense of the broad patterns of the empirical data in, people, in terms of people who are experiencing moral distress. What, are, what is the impact on them? Well, I think it's important to point out that one of the reasons for thinking seriously about mitigating moral distress is that even if it's not that common or that severe in all places, its effects on healthcare systems and day-to-day -day practice can be seriously negative for lots of people involved in, in the practice of care. There are immediate and short-term outcomes, I think, evidenced by moral distress taking place. Some of those fall on patient care directly. So a common result of the constraints that the institution might place on your ethical action or being faced with a moral dilemma that you're experiencing is sometimes called decisional paralysis. You simply don't know what to do and you're so averse to, doing what you, to not doing what you want to be able to do that's the right thing that you don't do anything. That's a very common trend in the experience of moral distress. It paralyzes people into inaction rather than action. And that of course can have a very immediate impact on patient care if you're not deciding simply because of the moral distress that you're experiencing. That can also, I think, sideline ethically robust and procedurally defensible processes of decision making. So, you know, we, we might avoid uh, 
uh, working out what the best and appropriate way of acting is because we just don't know what process to, to start, to, to invoke, to, to solve the problems that we face. There's also a negative impact on staff, including such things as insomnia, distraction, disillusionment with the job. A lot of evidence suggests that all of those features can be um, short-term, uh, impactful on the staff in the short term. And of course, long-term impacts as well on the healthcare systems more generally. Not attending to moral distress and not dealing with it can reinforce problematic institutional arrangements. The system doesn't change if we don't address the moral distress that people are experiencing. And the more we experience it, the less likely and, less, and the more difficult it is, I think, to change things that are wrong with the system that are causing this problem. And secondly, on, on the level of the staff themselves, there is lots of evidence to suggest that moral distress can, can produce burnout, has a much more long-term impact on a person's career, and indeed can lead, lead them to leave the profession entirely. So, you know, in a time of underemployment, particularly of nurses in this country and elsewhere, it's particularly important to recognise that moral distress and the burnout that follows from it can really make a, a bad problem even worse in terms of the understaffing of many of our hospital settings. We also see evidence that moral distress can lead to burnout among students and can even lead people to drop out of medical school or nursing school before they've even started being practitioners themselves. Thank you.